Those who are remaining, please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 16 this morning. Romans 16. And we are in the concluding portion of our study in Romans. I trust that as a result of this series that you would be able to answer the question about Romans. What is Romans about? What uh, is the subject matter or what are the themes of Romans? I hope that you can. And uh, I trust as well that you could do something that a lot of people could not and that's that you could give a general outline of the book of Romans. Many people who spend hours and hours and hours and years of their life studying Romans couldn't outline the book. That's a little sad, but it's very true. It's as though this portion is emphasized, this portion is studied, but it's each part and its place and the theme that the Holy Spirit was giving to the church isn't even understood as a whole. And so we're going to read our text this morning. I'll ask a couple questions by way of review, and then we're going to look at a great conclusion. I think I have a short message this morning. Romans 16 and verse 17, the Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Uh, let's read verse 19. It gives us a little more of an idea of the Spirit. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men, I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Let's pray, shall we? God, we do need your help this morning. And Lord, this matter of being wise concerning good and simple concerning evil is one where we, in many ways, could relate to. It's, I wish I didn't even know some things. And I wish I knew more about other things. I pray that you would help us to understand how to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to focus this morning, uh, not on the last verse, but I do love that statement. I would have you be wise concerning good and simple concerning evil. You'll never commit a sin you don't know about. You'll never commit a sin you don't know about. By the way, that's why the way is important. The way is important. I love what the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. You know why a 30-year-old can't get out of bed in the morning? He was never made to get out of bed when he was a kid. I mean, honestly. You know, you know why a person cannot control what they watch on television? They've never had to control what they watch on television. You know why some people can't control their tempers? They've never been made to control their tempers. You, you, you find somebody who has an out-of-control temper, and I promise you, it didn't happen somewhere, you know, in their mid-40s. I've always been calm and peaceful, and all of a sudden now, I'm just out of control. No. You, you know, you make a child uh, control his temper, and a child will know, hey, my temper can be controlled. You make a child get out of bed in the morning, and he'll know, you know what, I can get out of bed in the morning and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the way means this is the manner, the habit, the way that we are. And the Bible says if you train up a child the way he should go, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. It's really amazing how important our upbringing is. I would have you be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning evil. Sheltered. Sheltered was a term of derision when I was a child. Oh, you, your parents shelter you. You don't know about. You know, as though there's something to be proud about, you know, knowing about illicit drugs or inappropriate relationships, things that you're not supposed to know. 
And I've been made fun of a lot of times just for being ignorant about something because I'm sheltered. You know, I'll never be tempted by something that I don't know about. And if you and I have the attitude that we cannot be tempted by something, we're foolish. We're fools. It's amazing how we could be drawn into something that would not even have an interest simply by educating ourselves about it. You ever look at something, somebody, Tosh, give me that fidget. Yeah, that fidget. I saw on social media the other day, did anybody see these things? Mm -hmm. what are what is it? It's a fidget spinner. You didn't know that? No. <laughs> well, okay, so I saw a, a posting on social media the other day that said, what are you, you're an adult, right? <laughs> you're not 30 yet. No, I'm 26. Okay. <laughs> I saw a thing on, on social media that they had a mechanics wrench with the ratcheting end in it, you know. It said fidget spinner for you know, working men or working folks or whatever. Uh, they're making a fortune on these ridiculous. The people are paying. People pay money for these. It doesn't do anything. Oh, you just spin them? Yeah, you fidget. That's it? Yeah. I just want to play with them. I'm sorry, Patty. Wow. Okay. Do you want one? No, I want one. Okay. If you studied up enough, you might want one if you, if you learn a little bit more about it. <laughs> Something about it. Thank you. I was afraid you were going to play with it in church. It's all this way. I can fit. Okay. So they do things like they twirl them and they spin them, and it has, uh, it's like a gyroscope as far as the way it feels. And uh, it's, I can't think I want one. Uh, kind of see. No. <laughs> I'm going to use this in a little bit. That's what I'm for right now. Okay. So, now look at y'all looking at it. Is that stupid or what? Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely, well, okay. I'll make a point with that later on. Or I may, I may not. I'm thinking twice about it right now. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, the Apostle Paul has concluded in verse 19, he's really concluding all the material that he shared with the church at Rome. Now, you tell me, what was the makeup of the church at Rome? What? what was it? Jews and Greeks. Remember in Paul's introduction, after he said, I want to come shortly to you. Matter of fact, he said that in his conclusion in chapter 15. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the... Jew first, and also to the Greeks. Okay, that Jews and Greeks is a reoccurring theme that goes all the way through Romans. Okay, what was the issue that the church at Rome had? If you were to say they had an issue, what was the issue that was going on in the church? Paul was addressing. What? Yeah, differences between the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay, we asked a, a question, how did the Gentiles come to be part of the church at Rome? How did the Gentiles get, come to be part of the church at Rome? It's an important question. What? By the Jews. The Jews preached the gospel to them, right? Any Jew who's ever, any Gentile who's ever been saved owes his salvation to Jesus Christ first of all but has received the gospel because it was first preached by the Jews. A lot of times we don't realize that. Sometimes we don't realize that the Jews were the ones who were responsible for preaching the gospel of Christ first and foremost. Okay? So any person who's born again has to realize, hey, where did they, how did the gospel get preached in Antioch? How did the gospel get preached in Rome? Paul had never been to Rome, but there are Jews and Gentiles who are believers in Rome. How do they get to how do they get there? How do they get saved? Okay, what was the issue, though, that was really dividing the church at Rome? Keeping the law. Yeah, keeping the law. See, the Jews, when they preached the gospel to the Gentiles, had every expectation that being one in Christ, that the Gentiles would be just like them. And so their expectation was that the law would be both venerated, that it would be held up the way that they held up the law, and... Much of the material in Romans, Paul first of all establishes the universal need for salvation. 
chapters 1 through 3, Paul explains very, very clearly that the gospel is not only the power of God to salvation, but he explains that every person is responsible for the gospel, for receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he explains that, first of all, uh, by explaining that the Jews are responsible for the gospel because unto them was committed the oracles of God. That was a lot of the prophet in being Jewish. He explains that the Gentiles were responsible for the gospel because God's law was written in their hearts. But now in the church, the Jewish believers are really emphasizing circumcision and they're really emphasizing the keeping of the law. And by the way, we talked about this last week. The fact of the matter is, is that it would have been very offensive to have to rub shoulders, literally, with Gentiles if you're a Jew. We talked last week about habits that people have. Uh, you ever met a sneezer who doesn't cover his mouth? <laughs> I have. I've met adults who don't know, look away, and you know now it's like you don't sneeze on your hand because you touch things. You know, look away and like, sneeze on your shoulder or whatever. I met people who just chew <laughs> right on you. I'm just like, I didn't want that kind of shower, but now I'm going to go take one. You know? That's disgusting, isn't it? You ever met somebody that didn't know personal space? Uh, some cultures just don't do the, car the personal space thing. You talk to them, and, I mean, literally, they start leaning on you when you're talking to them. I don't like people to lean on me. My wife is the only person in the world who I like to touch me. That's it, period. And, then, and, then, and that's the way it's always going to be, by the way. And so... I don't like people in my personal space. By the way, in case you don't know, my personal space is as far as my arms can reach and then as far as your arms can reach. So if you're like this, you know, we can measure we can measure it out. That would be about, oh, I don't know. If you're, you know, four foot away from me, that's, you know, your space, my space, and then the international space in between there or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I'm being silly uh, to a certain extent. But those are things that are, you know, things that some customs just I don't like. And I meet people from... Uh, Russian men kiss. If I go to Europe, I'm not going to kiss the dudes. I, you know that that's their thing. That's a cultural thing. And, you know, you say, well, Pastor, if God called you there, you know, then maybe you'd do that. If you're, you know, that if part of that culture, now, if God made me part of that culture, I wouldn't know it was an issue. I'm sure, but I I'm not part of that culture, and so. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. My only point in saying all that is that there are things that, to me, I would not like and that would be very offensive. And just the interaction with Gentiles in the same room as the Jews, particularly when they're worshiping their God, you don't think about the cultural implications of that, but it's major. The, the, the filthy things that Gentiles would eat, just that by itself was really, really disgusting. And so the Jews thought, well, you know, they're saved. Maybe they'll clean up a little bit. Maybe they'll straighten up again. Uh, maybe they'll straighten up a little bit. But there were things that God had not called for. And so the Apostle Paul used the illustration of Abraham to help the Jews understand that these things are not required for salvation for a Gentile. He used the illustration of Genesis 15 where Abraham believed God and his faith was counted for righteousness. And Paul asked a simple question, who came first, Abraham or Moses? Where did we get the law? Well, God gave His law to whom? Moses. To Moses. Who came first? Abraham or Moses? Help me, folks. Please Abraham. tell me you know who came first. Abraham came first. All right? So if Abraham came first and he was saved by faith and there was no law, has salvation ever been by the law instead of by faith? No. And so Paul establishes in Romans the law of faith. That's the law. The law of faith. And that's a doctrine, that's a teaching that in every age has been true, is that salvation has only been by faith. And then Paul said, Therefore by the uh, deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so Paul really trounces the concept of works for salvation. And he explains to the Jews that you aren't saved by works, you are saved by faith. You didn't keep the law. You were not able to keep the law. And you study uh, Galatians and you see the purpose of the law was a schoolmaster to show us or teach us that we needed Christ. So the law has benefits. The law is good, but Jesus had to come to fulfill the law because the law was never kept or fulfilled until Jesus. And so salvation has always been by 
faith. And then Paul deals with the Gentiles and their issues with the Jews. You ever feel like somebody feels like they're too good for you and you don't like that either? <laughs> I, somebody, I feel like, oh, they think they're too good for me. I feel excluded by them. And then what do, what do people that think that people think they're too good for them do? How do they act that out? They usually exclude the people that they think are excluding them. Whether it's real or, or not. <laughs> and that's what the Gentiles were doing. And the Gentiles began to boast about the fact that, hey, you know, the Jews rejected Jesus, but we received Jesus. And they forgot that they received Jesus as a result of Jews who would received Jesus preaching the Gospel to them. By the way, don't buy into that, friend. Never buy into the fact, or, uh, or into the lie, I should say, not the fact, that Jews don't get saved. Jews get saved, I believe, at the same rate that Gentiles do. And Jews get saved, my friend, the same way that Gentiles do. I would have to say, and this is just a guess, but I would say that proportionately in my ministry, I have seen as many Jews come to Jesus as anyone else. You preach the gospel to Jews the same as you do to Gentiles. You know the reason Jews don't get saved? Because we believe lies about it. We try to preach a different gospel to the Jews. The fact of the matter is they get saved the same as anyone else does. And you ask the question, where did the church come from? My friend, the church didn't start in Rome. Did you know that? Where did the church start? Where did the church begin? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And what group of people primarily made up the ethnic uh, population of Jerusalem? Jews. Jews did. So where did the church come from? What's the origin of the church? Jewish. It wasn't until Antioch, after the persecution that Christianity had its identity with Jesus instead of Judaism. Up until that point, it was perceived by people as Jews or a sect of Judaism who were believers in their Messiah. So the idea that Jews don't get saved or that Jews are different somehow, that's nonsensical. It simply is that in the church, when a church is what it's supposed to be, Jews find their identity in Jesus, not through Israel. And so there's a lot of this tension that's going on in the church. And Paul points out to the Gentiles who would boast about their faith in Christ as though for some reason they're better. He points out the analogy of the branches being cut off of the tree. Remember this? If the wild branches, which are contrary by nature, are grafted in, you know, if, if the regular branches which are cut off are grafted back into the tree, what's more natural in the tree? The branches that came from it or the branches that were grafted into it? What fits better, a, a, a believing Jew or a believing Gentile? Mm -hmm. Believing Jew, right? So Paul spent a lot of time talking to the Jews and really pouring out his heart. Romans chapter 9, he said, you know, I say the truth in Christ, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He said, I would be willing. I could wish myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. See, the reason is because until you get to chapter 9, all the way, or until chapter 7, it looks as though Paul is just a Gentile advocate and he hates his own kinsmen. Because, I mean, he's sticking up for the gospel by faith in Christ alone and not by works. And he's uh, really dealing with the whole uh, Judaizing of the Gentiles. And so he spends a good portion of time really helping the Jews to understand I'm still Jewish. But by the grace of God, I've got this apostleship to the Gentiles. And we saw last week the purpose of the Gentiles, or the usefulness of the Gentiles. We saw, first of all, that God's plan had always been for the Gentile nations to be saved to His glory. We saw also that not only did God always plan for the Gentiles to be saved, but they actually have a purpose in the church. You know what the ultimate purpose that Paul gave for an illustration was? He said, I'm, I have to, I'm coming to Rome, but I've got to go to Jerusalem right now. One of the primary missions that I'm taking care of in Jerusalem is that I'm taking the gift that came from Macedonia and Achaia to the saints at Jerusalem. Literally, the, the Gentiles that have been saved around the world were now financially taking care of their impoverished Jewish brethren and meeting their physical needs. Isn't that a beautiful picture? So Paul is uniting. He's saying, I have this grace of God, this apostleship that I was appointed to, and now I'm, I, I'm coming to Rome. I'm going to come visit you, you Jews in Rome and you Gentiles in Rome, but first I'm going to take the Gentile gift to Jerusalem. 
And then we saw that there's a call to holiness. God saved the Gentiles so that they could be holy, so they could come out from what they are. And I'm going to just tell you something. What we are before Jesus is despicable. You look at the things that the Gentiles were and, and uh, the things that they did before Christ, and the Bible says that, that the Gentiles are called to holiness. They're called uh, to be a part of the church, to be to bear the testimony of the grace of God. What a wonderful testimony that is. So is there anything that Paul is saying about not having to keep the law that he's saying, well, the Gentiles can just come into the church and they can just bring their uh, rascally Gentile selves in and all their nasty habits and just remain the way that they are and that's just fine. You Jews need to accept it. Is that what he's saying? Not at all. Not in your life. He's saying they need to be called to sanctification and to holiness, but that isn't the means for their salvation. It's a beautiful conclusion that Paul has come up with. And now, if you were to read the rest of chapter 15, you would see a, really a heartfelt conclusion or a heartfelt personal greetings that Paul is making. He begins chapter 16 by writing to the church of Rome saying, Hey, my sister, uh, Phoebe, she's going to be coming to Rome and I want you to receive her because she is a minister of Christ. She's ministered to me. She's going to minister to you. And uh, I, I want you to receive her and I want you to help her. And he just has a lot of really beautiful personal, um, personal notes to individuals and about behaviors. And that's right where we find ourselves in the short commands that we see for today. And then right in the middle of that, as Paul is concluding and saying a few things, he said, now I beseech you, brethren. Now beseech is again when uh, the Holy Spirit uses in the Word of God the word beseech. That's something that really ought to get our attention quite a bit. You ever just wished somebody could do something that they needed to do, that needed to be done, and that was good for them? You ever thought that? Now I'll tell you, there are parents that would love to beseech their children. There are parents who have wayward children who are literally are going down a path of destruction that is a known path. It's amazing, isn't it, that many times we tend to think that if we do the same thing that someone else has done, for some reason we have a better reason that they did, and for some reason we're going to have a better outcome. And yet, historically speaking, no one ever has. In other words, sin has the same effect that it always has had, and there aren't any exceptions to it. And there are parents that can see their kids going down a pathway, and they say, I've seen that. I may have even been there before. And you'd say, would you please not do that? Well, it's very, very hard as a pastor to watch people self-destruct spiritually. You watch people, they make a decision. You know, Pastor, I'll pick up an extra job and I won't be able to be in church. I know what that will do. I know what will happen to somebody who makes that decision. I beg you don't do that. You say, Pastor, that's because you know we don't need so many empty seats at church. No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with what will happen to you. And I'm begging you, do the right thing for your own good. And that's the idea of beseech you. I'm begging you to do something that's for your good. And so now Paul says, mark them. It's interesting that word, mark them. The word, mark them. You know the word behind mark them is a word similar. How many, how many of you are uh, into shooting targets or any target practice at all? Any archers in here today? Even though this is archery? Nobody's going to admit to it. Wow, a bunch of Wow, non-archers. I was going to call you something, but non-archers. Uh, anybody shoot firearms? A few of those. Okay. So, all right. So now you know a mark, right? You know what a target is, right? A mark. All right. Anybody ever seen? I saw on the History Channel a documentary when I was on vacation a few years ago. A guy that shot reflexively, and he was he was older. A man who's like a quick draw, and they figured they they actually put. Uh, they actually attached his head uh, to all these little sensors that figured out what parts of the brain he was using. And they figured out that he actually fired his pistol reflexively. And I mean, literally faster than, faster than you could see, he could shoot like five or six balloons. And I mean, just the quick draw was amazing. And the accuracy the guy had was unbelievable. And they said that he practiced so much that he'd actually reprogrammed his brain to where instead of focusing and uh, finding a mark, he would actually... Uh, just do it as a reflex. So the same part of the brain that most people, you know, use for balance or to keep from falling, he used for shooting. 
So that's, that's not a very good illustration for most of us. Most of us need to find our mark. A, a few years ago at the Bill Rice Ranch Men's Retreat, they had the first target challenge, and I won. I won the free rifle uh, with the target challenge. Last year, I don't think I tried. I might have. The year before I tried, and I got really frustrated because there's, a, there's something that makes the sights blur between the rifles for me at my age right now. Isn't that terrible? I mean, I just can't. I don't know what makes the sights blur. I think I think something's wrong with all the sights on all the rifles I look at, because sights scope. I'm a scope guy now. I gotta have a scope, uh, because something happens between the rear sight and the front sight that makes it so that I can't see both of those and the target. I can't. I can't see the mark. The idea of mark means to literally zone in on, to literally get a hold of and uh, focus on that thing and keep your eye on it. You ever try to watch a mosquito in the room? You, ever, you know, it's kind of, there's, there's a light on, but it's dim. What happens when the mosquito goes by the light? It's like, zzz, he goes out of focus, right? I'm one of those mosquito grabbers. I try to <laughs> grab them. I can do it with chopsticks, but I can't do it with my hand. But, you know, I try to grab a mosquito. And what happens is they, I can't keep my focus on them. They're just, you know, they're going like this. You always find a mosquito when you hear it, right? You're minding your own business, all of a sudden, I don't know what they like about ears, but they do, and you're like, oh, and then you find him, and I'll be watching the mosquito so I can grab him or slap him or smack him, and then all of a sudden, maybe he'll go by a light, and he vanishes. And until I hear him again, I can't get it. The idea of mark is not to let something out of your sight. Just keep your eye on it, see it, mark it, and stay focused on it. That's interesting. The Bible says, mark them which cause division among you. Mark them which cause division among you. Pastor, who are the troublemakers in your church? I better be able to tell you. <laughs> Seriously. What are the problems? What are the problems? You better know. You know that believer? The Bible says, mark them which cause division among you. think that, that that was a first century problem? Was that a first century issue? People that caused problems? Jews picking on Gentiles, Gentiles picking on Jews. You think that only happened back then? No. And now Paul said to the churches, now if you guys are going to, having the diffs, get diffs, having gifts differing according to the grace of God. I'm just going to make a new phrase. Instead of saying gifts differing according to the grace of God, we're going to call it our spiritual diffs. Okay. Uh, having, having gifts differing according to the grace of God. And he talks about how that we are to accomplish the work of the ministry by exercising our spiritual gifts. We're supposed to mark those people that are trying to stop that from happening. That are actually trying to pick. you got a guy that always, always, always has something to say. You know... Let me just tell you something about the Gentiles. Let me, let, let's look at the people. Let's look at the characteristics of the people we're to mark. Notice this. Verse 18, the Bible says, in the last phrase it says, by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, when we're told to mark those that cause division, usually we think, here's somebody that comes in, he's loud, he's brassy, he's obnoxious, nobody likes him, and he is able to create a divide or cause a division. But it actually isn't so. The Bible says that they give good speeches. They give fair speeches. They have good words. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> you know that I have discovered that individuals who are trying to destroy the work of God always try to present themselves as the good guy. I've never seen a guy who's doing the wrong thing. I shouldn't say I've never but I, I would say I seldom, and I can't think of the exception, a guy who's causing division, I've never seen the guy act like a bad guy. Usually does wrong, gets responded to, and then talks about how mean-spirited you are. Here's, here's one of my favorite phrases to hate. It isn't what you said. Finish it for me. It's how you said it. Those are good words. That's fair speech, but you know that doesn't make any sense at all. In other words, you don't care about what's said, but you care about how it's said. Let's try that in life and see how it works for us, okay? Um, <laughs> supposing I were friends with uh, the President of the United States right now, and I knew he was about to bash a corporation. 
publicly? What happens when our president bashes a corporation? Stock goes down. Their stock plummets, okay? Suppose I knew he was going to compliment a corporation. Stock goes up, right? His, his words actually have a pretty, uh, pretty major financial effect on uh, things. If he, if he says something about it, you know, relations or whatever. Supposing I knew that, knew he told me, hey, I'm going to say something about it. I'm going to say something about a country or whatever. Supposing I knew our president tomorrow was going to come out and he's going to go after, I don't know, some major for Walmart. He's going to have a problem with Walmart. He's going to say, we need to make America great again. That means we need to buy America the way Sam Walton did back in the day. And uh, you know what? We reject Walmart, anything to do with Walmart, and so forth. If I knew he was going to do that, and I came to you and I said, you know, I have, I, I'm, I'm friends with the, his orangeness. That, that was disrespectful, wasn't it? I shouldn't talk about the president. I'm friends with the president. And I think you should buy Walmart. And I love you. And the next day he comes out and bashes Walmart. You bought Walmart because I said it nicely and told you I loved you. It isn't what I said, it's how I said it, right? Isn't that so? Trivia toss is true. I got your fidget. I'm going to give it back. <laughs> true? No. Actually, what you say matters, doesn't it? Well, you know what? He said it's so nice, it doesn't hurt me that I lost all my, all my savings. Is that true? I mean, I mean, he said he loved me. Is that true? No. What actually matters more? If I said, you know, I can't really stand you, but I'm going to give you a tip anyway. Trump's about to bash Walmart, you better sell. The next day you say, it isn't what he said, it's how he said it. No? So I don't care how he said it, at least I did, at least I bailed on Walmart in time, right? Isn't it so? In other words, my friend, what's more important, truth or the niceties that it's cloaked? I'm not I'm not against niceties. But I'm just asking the question, is that is that an important statement? In other words, the, the false teacher, the guy who causes division in the church, says things with good words and fair speech. He's handsome, he's debonair, he's winsome, he makes you feel good. And he separates you from the brethren and from God. And the Bible says, mark them. Don't let them go out of your sight. Know who they are. Watch them. God help us to embrace just a little bit less. I'm not saying we shouldn't be nice. I, I like nice, by the way, in case you're concerned or you wonder about it. I do like things to be nice. But God help us to care more about truth than anything else. Truth and love, wonderful. But truth, folks, right. truth. Because this guy has false doctrine and it is just beautiful. It's packaged oh so nicely and is destroying the church. You can have a guy that comes in and he says, you know, I'll just tell you something. Brother, I have a few concerns about some of the Gentiles here. Now, you know I love the Gentiles. You know I love the Gentiles, don't you? I just love the Gentiles. I love them, love them, love them, love them. What God thinks about, and He makes some pretty good points about something, and gives a real good speech, and concludes it by, you know, but I, I just really love them. And you go away and you think, you know, those Gentiles, I don't know how God could love them. Well, He's got a good point about that, and He keeps making points. Gentile comes in, does the same thing about the Jews. You know, there's something about people killing Jesus, crying, crucify Him, that just makes me despise a race. And he sounds righteous and he sounds good and all that. And it's not. The Bible says, mark them which cause divisions among you. You know what a division, the word division is, is, uh, is the same word that uh, means dissension. Uh, separation. Separating things. And the Bible says, and they cause, this is really interesting, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. 
And the word for offense is where we get our word scandal from, scandalon. Uh, and the word for offense is the same word that is the movable part in the trap. You know, you have a box, you have a stick, and when the animal hits the stick, the box drops and traps them. That's the word for offense. Uh, when we're talking about a stumbling block to the Gentiles, Christ being a stumbling block, that's the word for offense. It literally is the thing that tricks, trips the trap. An individual which is setting a trap, is that for your good or for your evil? You ever find out, you know what, whenever I get involved with this person, I always find myself on the GOAT team. <laughs> you ever know what I'm talking about? You know, I. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've gone to a new church. Thank God I, I don't really leave churches. I've been able to be in... Uh, you know, when we planted this church, I was assistant pastor at West Park Baptist Church, and Pastor McClure will tell you I never left there. He said, go there, we sent him out to plant a church. I think it's a good way uh, to be. I remember when I was in seminary, I went, I, I had been assistant pastor, went back to seminary, and I joined a church in town, and a guy immediately came, we were at a, they were at a fellowship at somebody's farm, and he came and he said, hey brother, would you like to go to lunch sometime? I wasn't, I'd never been to the let's go to lunch crowd before. And I heard about it, but I'd never been to one. So we went to lunch, and uh, he started buttering me up. I mean, he started, yeah, you know, I heard you, you know, da, 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 you know like, all kinds of nice things about me. So I, I, I you know, I, I want to ask you some questions about what you think about some things. <laughs> started asking me questions about what I think about some things, and all the questions had to do with the pastor and the way he did things versus how I do things. That's what all the questions were about. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, I just here's why I think he's right about it. And he was right about it in those in those instances. He wasn't right about everything. Nobody's right about everything. And uh, and then I went and told the pastor about it. You know what that guy's trying to do? He was trying to get me to take the issues that he had with the pastor and the way the pastor did things to the pastor. And you know who would, have, who would have gotten caught in the trap on that one? Me. I would have got caught in the trap, all for a free lunch. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want that. And there are people like that, and you better mark them. And the Bible says the second thing we're to do is avoid them. Now, it's interesting, the word avoid there is the word separate. It's separate. So the idea isn't, you know, he comes in, oh, I'm going to go out this door. You know, he comes in that door, and when he comes in, you know, you go out this one. The idea of avoid them is don't come in that door. That's what it means by avoid them. And literally, it's, it's interrelated with the concept of church discipline. You know, the Bible says when we're supposed to take and turn someone over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. By the way, you've got to be a church member to discipline, uh, to be disciplined in a church. If you're not a church member, you're unwilling to be disciplined. You're not under authority. It's, it's a pretty important, true concept. You can tell a rebel when they won't join a church. It's a fact. You can't, uh, so you have somebody who is causing division or causing trouble, and you know what you do when you avoid them? You take them, you show them the Word of God, say, this is what the Word of God says, this is what you've done, would you please get right and be restored to the fellowship? And then if they won't, you take a brother and you ask them the same questions, and if not, then you take the church, and the church says, you know what, if you're not going to get right, we're going to have to avoid you, it means you've got to leave. That's what the word avoid means. Separate from means you can't be here with us. It's not a, you know, a try, try not to talk to them. But no, it's the idea for the church at Rome is get them out. Get them out. Most believers today, sadly, do not even understand the concept of church discipline. Don't even know what it is. Uh, most people think church discipline is being on time. I, we could use a little more of that. Uh, they think church discipline is being more faithful. We could use a little more of that, but church discipline is the avoiding part. It's the turn over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so they can be ashamed and ultimately so they can get right. Okay, let's finish up. Division is dissension. Things that separate people. Offenses are... Um, I'm sorry. 
I said that wrong. Yeah, offenses are the stumbling blocks or the things that trip the trap. And then the Bible says that these things are contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. What doctrine have they learned? I hope you can answer this question. We're in Romans. What doctrine did they learn? Salvation. Salvation's by faith. God has a future plan with Israel. The church in Israel are not the same, but God has for the Jews and the Greeks to be 100% part of His plan, having them di gifts differing according to the grace of God. Someday all Israel is going to be saved. My friends, someday we're all going to be part of Israel. Someday we're going to all be involved with Israel. Right now God's working in the church. And Paul says, get on board and move with it. And he said, anybody that's not with that doctrine, mark them and avoid them. Separate them out. Get away from them. And it says, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. So why is it that any person would embrace false doctrine? You know they may have all the righteous statements. Well, I just want or I just wish or if only people could feel or understand reality of it is is that it isn't about the doctrine of Christ. Let me say a word about the doctrine of Christ. You know, one of the things that you find to be a very interesting study is if you just study the word doctrine and the word of God, the didache, the word that we get the word teaching from, doctrine means teaching. And by the way, I'm kind of glad, aren't you, that we're past that phase, the trend in the church to uh, hate teaching. I, even, even in the not, not really great, even the Catholics are trying to teach right now, having Bible studies and so forth. Remember uh, like 15 years ago, people said, you come to our church. We won't try to teach you doctrine. Remember that a few years back? Oh, we're not all about the doctrine. We're not all about as though there's something evil. But doctrine means teaching. And it's interesting, you study the Bible, there's 51 instances, actually, the word doctrine being used. Most of those instances occur in the New Testament. Most of them are references to Jesus. Most of them are Jesus' doctrine. He, he was different than the Gentiles because he taught with authority, not like the Jews. And they, he talked about the doctrine of God Jesus talked about. So what's the source of, of the doctrine? God is. If you were to study uh, the, the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, you'd see over and over and over the emphasis of holding to the doctrine that they were taught. Where do you find that doctrine, that teaching? This book, my friend. Listen, you get in a church and it isn't about teaching this book. Getting into this word, lifting this book up, my friend. It's a church that's devoid of doctrine. You can have good reason. You can have good philosophy. You can have somebody who has a mullet like Joel Osteen and you won't have anything that's worthwhile. I just cracked a joke and you always want to <laughs> The reality of it is, my friend, is doctrine is what's important. And doctrine, the source of doctrine is the Word of God. And Paul said the doctrine which ye have learned. Okay, so a, a teaching uh, that would say, you know what we need to do? We need to reach Jews. Let's go and start a Messianic synagogue for Jews to worship Jesus their own way. Let me ask you a question about that. How Paul say that Jews and Gentiles were supposed to worship? Huh? Same way. Church. Having then gifts differing according to the grace of God. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy, whether he goes through the gifts. You know how Jews and Gentiles are supposed to worship? <laughs> One in Christ. So what is it when somebody will come into the church and say, well, you know, we're, mess we're messianic. And they'll go off and start a synagogue system when Christ established His church. What is that? It's contrary doctrine, isn't it? You know, I... I I hate to say it, but I have friends that are part of that whole messianic nonsense, and um, I don't have anything to do with it. It's heresy. It's heresy. Judaism, Judaism in synagogue worship is extra biblical in its entirety. Judaism is nothing but a pagan religion. It's an assembling of pagan practices has very little to do with anything that's taught in the Scripture, period. And a person who would go and join that is a person who is separated from sound doctrine. Paul said Jews and Gentiles together, they say, oh, let's, let's separate Jews. You, what, is it, what does that say to the Gentiles? What does Messianic Christianity say to the Gentiles? You've always been less and you still are. You're not the same as us. 
And it, the entire concept contradicts the whole of Romans. I don't know where that came from, but it fits. It fits the description here, don't you think? Mark them which cause division contrary to the doctrine which you have learned to avoid them. And the Bible says, For they that are such serve not their, our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I said, I've been on the GOAT team before. Have you? You ever heard a good reason or a good um, example without all the facts? I give one example of this, and I'll finish with this today. Her being an assistant pastor in Delray Beach about 50 years ago, I think it was. And I remember they were having a preacher roast, really. It, I, it really doesn't happen in most uh, churches that I'm in, but it really did happen one time. I remember walking in, and there were four ladies in the front of the auditorium, and they were decorating. They were doing the decorations. And I heard something like, and we spent $2,500, and we got one for free from somebody else, and pastor just had to have it, and da 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 And they were talking about the new playground equipment that pastor had bought for our summer day camp. And we'd had a chance to get, uh, it was like a $10,000 thing, and, and a, a company, a guy that came to one of our one of our ministries said, you know what, I'm closing this out, and I'll give it to you at half my cost and set it up for you. And we didn't have it in our budget, so pastor paid for it personally and bought it. And I knew that pastor paid for it personally, but nobody else did. And at the same time, another lady came and she said, you know what, I bought this for my kids. It was just a really elaborate playground thing. And she said, you know, they're grown up. Would you like to have it? And we got it for free after pastor had already bought the other one. So we got two of them. And we had six acres of property, so it was nice. You know, we had a lot of nice playground stuff. But I heard, and he spent da 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 <laughs> And uh, I asked, we don't have the money in our budget. How did he spend it? Just walked in. I said, we don't have the money in our budget. We don't have it in the bank. How did he spend it? Well, that's the real point. Bow, 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 bow. I said, you know what? He took it out of his savings and paid for it himself, and I know that personally. And I told the lady, I said, you're just, you're just gossiping. You're just tearing down. You're just trying to hurt somebody. You don't know what happened. You don't know the information. Now, let me ask you a question. If we didn't have money in our budget, and we got a great deal for $2,500, and pastor wrote a bad check because it was a great deal. Is that wise? No. Okay, so, you know, a lot of times I think that lack of information or misinformation is where a lot of problems come from. Isn't it so? In other words, I would have to say that what that person was saying, I agree with. You shouldn't spend money you don't have. Don't you agree with that? Should anybody spend money they don't have? No, you ought to do so. It's not right. But is that what happened? You know, I found out a lot of times, a lot of what goes on about people talking about things is people talking about things they don't know about. They don't know. They don't know about it. They don't know how it happened. They don't know what it did. What they did. I heard about it. I had somebody in our first year of our ministry tell me, you know, you make plenty. I didn't get paid our first two years of our church, working in our church. They didn't make a dime. didn't make a penny. Our first two years didn't make anything. Zero dollars. And somebody said, you make plenty. And I heard somebody else talking about, you know, I, you know, pastor makes, you know, da, da, da. and they were talking about because of all the things I got to do. I was always flying places our first year of our ministry. I'll tell you what happened. God gave me like a bunch of free flights. I mean, it's like uh, AirTran had this thing uh, with Wendy's where if you got 17 medium cups, you could get a, a one-way ticket and you could get as many as four per person, four one-way tickets, two round-trip flights. And so my wife and I and my brother-in-law, we went trash digging at Wendy's. We went around and pulled cups out of Wendy's, and I got four free flights. And then literally for two years' time, I'll tell you, the first two years of our ministry, when I had zero income, every time I would fly AirTran, I'd tell her, okay, we're going to get on this plane, they're going to cancel our flight due to mechanical problems. And then they would issue us vouchers for another free flight. I'm telling you, we flew AirTran. Um, I had to fly to a funeral that somebody else paid for for me to fly and preach a funeral. And I got bumped, and I was 30 minutes late, and I got like $800, and my wife got $800 in vouchers for waiting 30 minutes to be re being re redirected away that would make us 30 minutes later. And then every time we flew Delta, one time we were in Charlotte, and I looked out the window, and I watched the pilot come out, shake hands with the stewards and stewards, uh, the stewards and stewardesses, and they all walked off, and I like, 
That's weird. I've never seen that happen before. They had a strike. And so Delta had to give us big vouchers. And literally, I mean, I just flew boom, 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 all over the country. And so he said, well, he just flies everywhere. You know he's got, you know he's making too much money. He can just fly, 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 fly. He can make a dollar. But I got all kinds of free flights. And I'm just telling you something. Serving God's good. I mean, God just takes care of you. But people don't know about that. Just, oh, you, he can, he can, if he can afford to fly, you know what I'm talking about? So, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have received. And avoid them. Avoid them. Why? Because if anything is in the church going to hinder God's work, it's going to be a spirit or a heart or an attitude that has to do with building me up and making me the right and righteous one and consequently making very little out of Jesus. You know, you make a lot out of Jesus, people aren't so much, are they? If you build up Jesus, you don't really think about personalities very much, do you? God's working in your heart. You're not really thinking about even the servant whom God is using to work in your heart. So there are characteristics. Friend, if you get a little glimmer, a little glimpse, you say, Pastor, we shouldn't be critical. We shouldn't be contentious. You know, it's interesting that Jude said that we are to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And I wonder how it's possible to contend without seeming to be contentious. You ever wonder that question? You're not going out picking fights. You're doing battle. Does a contentious person seem nice? Can you be nice and be contentious? Could you? Could you? Sure. Would the person you're contending with think you're nice? Here, Phil, has anyone here ever been wrong? Let's just have a confession here. Anyone here ever been wrong? Anyone ever been wrong about anything? You ever been rebuked for anything? Did it feel good? Did it, oh, man. I hope that would happen today. I don't like it. You don't like it. But truth is truth, friend. And the church, one of the things Paul is concluding with is saying to the believers, you know what, you need to understand the purpose of the Jews, how God's using the Jews, how God's using the Gentiles. And you need to look for people that are trying to circumvent what God is doing. You need to mark them, and you need to avoid them. And you need to hold to the doctrine which you've received, which has been preached, which has been taught. And that's what we need to be, friends. Don't give up your doctrine. Don't give up your truth. Don't let it be compromised. No matter the argument or how sincere it may be. I said I was going to finish, and I will, in a few hours. That was my last illustration a minute ago. One last thing. Have you noticed that today we're not like they are is a selling point? We have to be careful about that as Christians, shouldn't we? Come to our church. I've seen this on billboards, I've seen it on web pages, and I've heard it in person. Come to our church. We won't judge you for what you wear. That's nice, isn't it? Isn't that nice? How would you like if you came here today and I judge you for what you're wearing? Joel's wearing polka dots. No judgment here, Joel. You really are. I just looked at you and saw polka dots. Okay, what if you were judged for... <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, what if you came to church and you were judged on the basis of what you uh, what you wear? And people didn't happen to think polka dots were... What of it? That's not nice. I'll be honest with you. I've never gone to a church. I'm just telling you. I've never gone to a church that really judged people on what they wear. It's never happened. I've gone to church where people think that people judge people on what they wear based on what they wear. I visited a church a few years ago, and it was a Wednesday night, and I wore a sport coat just because, you know, that's what I always do. And uh, the pastor of uh, the deacons came to me and said, we, we, don't, we don't wear a suit coat on Wednesday nights. Okay. 
Then the, after that, three deacons, three people, I greeted three men, and they told me they don't wear suit coats on Wednesday nights. And then the pastor told me, you know, we, we, we don't wear suit coats on Wednesday nights. And I told them, I said, you know, I think God will be able to wear a suit coat and not be judged. <laughs> in other words, I didn't think a thing about those guys wearing suit coats, but they sure thought, I mean, maybe it made them uncomfortable that I did, but I think that they judge how people dress in that church. A little bit. Oh, come to our church, we don't judge people for how they dress, unless they, you know, wear a suit coat. You know? Hey, listen, what does that have to do with doctrine? <coughs> what does that have to do with doctrine anywhere or anything? Does that have anything to do with anything? Not one bit, my friend. There are biblical principles for the way a Christian ought to purport themselves. have nothing to do with whether you're wearing a suit or not. Isn't it so? Okay. So when a church says, come to our church, we don't judge people on the basis of how they dress, what are they saying? Those other people judge you, but we don't. That's not nice, is it? Calvary Chapel here in Fort Lauderdale, for years, every time I meet someone from Calvary Chapel, here's what they say. You know, we're Baptist in doctrine. They're not Baptist in doctrine. They're Baptist and charismatic in doctrine. But we're Baptist in doctrine, but we are different than the Baptists. I always feel kind of hurt by this. We're different than the Baptists. We're not all about numbers. They have an average of 20,000 in attendance, and they post their attendance on their webpage every week. And we don't take up an offering in our church. You know, Baptists are all about offerings. We don't take up an offering in our church. We just we have a collection plate in the back. And, uh, you know, we don't. what's the difference? You know what it is? It's like, it is... Why would someone bash Baptists for being all about numbers and taking up their doctrine? Or, I mean, not taking up their doctrine, taking up an offering. Why would you say that that's what Baptists do? Promote yourself. Promote yourself. That's kind of shameless, isn't it? That's, that's the honest truth. In other words, so here's a question. In the church at Rome, why would a Jew say something hurtful or harmful about a Gentile and vice versa? Let's promote yourself. That's what the Bible says. And you mark my words, a person who is dividing the church is a person who is not promoting Jesus. They're a person who is promoting their system, their organization. They're promoting themselves. And Paul said, mark them! Separate from them. Avoid them. I hope that's a help. Father, thank you for what you've taught us today. We ask that you would increase the truth of in our hearts and help us to apply it. We pray in Jesus' name. Just a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. This morning we're going to sing. I have to make sure I didn't change on me. Uh, page 251. Almost persuaded. The invitation this morning is simple. The message this morning has not been purely gospel. We haven't emphasized that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father by, but by Him. We have emphasized, we did mention, that salvation is by faith, and it's by faith in Jesus Christ. It's simply believing in who Jesus is. The message has really been an insightful message to believers. It's a message about what are the marks of a person who is <coughs> pretending to be something that he isn't for the purpose of promoting himself and setting aside Jesus Christ. So what are we to do? If God's helped you with that, if He's shown you truth, the invitation is pretty simple this morning. While we sing uh, page 251, Almost Persuaded, if God spoke, do you want to just do business with Him this morning? Page 251, if, you could, if you're physically able to do so, let's stand on our feet and let's sing Almost Persuaded.